Good evening. Good to see each and every one of you here. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at some words to a song. It's number 46. I'm sorry, 41 in your songbooks. Number 41. Um, So we're still going to sing that other song that's missing right there. We're just going to do it a little bit delayed here. (laughs) Uh, You know, there's normally another song there and... uh, I think, um, okay, hello, there it is. I think that Tom was considering we were going to have uh, a singing like we're going to do the end of next week. We should have an evening of song uh, for the entire service uh, next Sunday evening. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion about whether I was going to be here or not, so there were some arrangements done, but we're back where we are. But I did want to include something about this particular song tonight. And the word, if you would open your songbooks to to number 41, because I want you you to kind of have it as a reference alongside with your Bible of some of the words that are there. The the title of the song is Be Still My Soul. And people use that terminology, they use a phrase like that, of kind of an expression of affection or something like that. Uh, Be still my beating heart, things like that that they'll say. But this is really a phrase that we see a number of times throughout the Bible that expresses the idea of being calm about confidence in God and His promises and the things that are important and not letting the troubles of life derail us from where God wants us to be. And one place that we find this mentioned and very likely the place that this comes from is Psalm 46 and verse 10 where it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now the song, if you look on page 41 of the songbook, the, the next phrase after be still my soul is the phrase, The Lord is on thy side. The Lord is on thy side. I want to just think about that from the standpoint of people who don't really think that God is on their side. Obviously, there are people that don't believe in God, but there are also people who think of God as being more or less just someone, a being who's just trying to trap us and trying to find enough reasons that he can to cast us into hell. Well, he doesn't need to look for any reasons. He's already got them, you know. That there, there is sin that separates us from God and gives, as Chris elaborated on, of what we deserve is, is we deserve hell. All of us do. I think anybody who doesn't realize that that's what they deserve were it not for the grace of God, were it not for the sacrifice that Jesus made, that's where they would be. And if we don't realize that, then we're not going to appreciate God's love and mercy and grace as much as we should. But it is important for us to perceive God as one who is indeed on our side. He, is, he wants what's best for us. Notice this phrase from 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward, wish it, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is God's desire, is that no one would perish, that all would come to repentance. Now, God is not... Ignorant of the fact that most people are not going to. That there have already been millions of people who have chosen not to. But, but there is still from God's perspective, He wishes that all would repent and that, all would, that none would perish. In the, in the previous ch- uh, book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. And just that last phrase, He cares for you. That, That is that God really does care for you. He really wants what's best for you. We see this also expressed in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, when He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And we need to realize... This is something not only to say to those that are Christians, those that have obeyed the gospel, those that are following Christ, this is something that the people that are lost in sin need to realize, that God is for you. He wants you to be saved. 
And he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That is, he will give us the things that we need particularly towards salvation because look what he did. Look at the demonstration of how much he does. He really is for us. He's willing to send his son to die for us. And to, to see that not only as a requirement, but that it is motivated by God's love for you. He really is for you. And that's that description. God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Including the devil. Including his, his forces. And then as you go on in this, in this song, the song lyrics, then that being the case, be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. It's kind of like someone talking to themselves, isn't it? He's saying, be still my soul. I'm talking to myself, reminding myself that God is on my side. And so then he says, bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. That is, to have a burden like grief, to have a burden like pain, to have, whether that's physical pain, whether it's emotional pain, whether it's abandonment pain, whether it's somebody who has betrayed our trust kind of pain, or whether it's any number of things that might have to do with that, or even literal pain, physical pain that we endure. And to bear patiently with these things. Things that maybe we face that we didn't do anything to bring it on ourselves. It just, it's just things that came on us either by circumstances or maybe because of the misdeeds of others. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, the context is actually talking about servants, bond servants who are being mistreated by their masters and the attitude they should have. But the principle, when he says to bear patiently these things that we're going through and to know that that is commendable with God. That is, God appreciates this even if no one else either knows about it or, or has that kind of appreciation for it. He says, this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Did I give the Scripture? 1 Peter 2, 19 and 20. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So he's saying, you know, there are things we bring on ourselves. There are things, there are problems and pains and griefs and such. <laughs> Maybe in some ways those are the things that we... They can be the biggest burdens because we know we really did some things that brought this on ourselves. But in, in, in any case, to realize that maybe there's things that we suffer that we really don't deserve. But he says, when we take it patiently, this is commendable with God. And, and hopefully that's the kind of thing that can help us to keep our soul still, so to speak, as the song begins with. That we don't let ourselves become... Oh, just anxious and, and worried and, and distraught and turning away from God or reacting in ways that are, un, that are not good. That we just know that God appreciates that we're continuing to keep on, keeping on, keep on doing what we should, making choices that are, com, that are in accordance with God's will. Even if no one else, else, even if no one else appreciates it. Because it's God that we're looking to. We're looking to God not only to provide us some of the things we sang about in a couple of the songs. I, I was just noticing it probably because I had in mind what I was about to preach. But uh, you picked out several songs today, including this morning, that relate to heaven. And tonight, you know, we talked about hand in hand with Jesus and not only here in this life, but in the life to come and how beautiful heaven must be. And that it certainly, when we really think about it, just it should be the kind of thing that reminds us just how wonderful it will be to be with Him, but also to look to God to provide for us and to recognize what He has already provided. But we think about things that we're worried about and we're anxious about and we're, we're not being patient about. It's part of that is depending on 
waiting on God and His time. As the song goes on to say, leave to thy God to order and provide. And especially the things we don't have any control over. There's things we can do, but there's a lot of things we can't do. It might be in relation to the circumstances of our society. It may, have, may be in regard to things that have to do with uh, people around us. It may have to do with our own particular situation. But Jesus is telling His apostles, and as we think about these men that He's telling this to, we realize that they're definitely going to be facing some very hard times in the days ahead as Jesus is preparing them for this and reminding them that God is there to provide, and He does. He, he provides for the whole creation. Matthew 6, 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they, sow, they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You know, we think about what He just says here. <laughs> they don't go plant a crop, but they're glad to eat it when you do. <laughs> They, it's provided for them. You know, the birds, the birds find food, don't they? And he says, aren't you more valuable than they are? He goes on and he says in verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. We have imitations of some of that glory that really what, what is provided with what God did for them, that the, the flowers of the field, the beauties of the springtime or even, uh, even in the summer. And he goes on, he says, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There's so much wisdom in the words of Jesus here as He's reminding us to put priorities in order. And here's what can sometimes happen is exactly the opposite. That people get so worried about material things and their material needs that they set aside the things of God and ignore the things of God and think, well, I'll get around to those once I catch up on these others. And we've given the devil a really good tool because he can use that in ways to occupy us with so many things we never do get around to doing what we need to for God, both in regard to our own spiritual growth and in regard to our need to help others and teach them the Gospel and help to spread the borders of the Kingdom in that way. So when we say, be still my soul, it's also about leaving God His part to order and to provide because He is always faithful in every, as the next phrase says, in every change, He faithful will remain. He will remain faithful in everything that goes through. God does not vary in His integrity. Psalm 20, 62 and verse 6 says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Trusting and continuing, continuing to be connected with God is something that we can depend on. And the consequence in the end is the last part of that verse says, Be still my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways, leads to a joyful end. That is, your best friend you know, I think a few years ago, they, I don't know if it was with texting or emailing or whatever, somebody came up with, a, with the, the acronym BFF. And, and so the kids would start, oh, they're my BFF. They're my best friend forever. You know. Well, 
Actually, if you kind of follow it along, you realize their BFF now is not their BFF <laughs> sometime later. All of a sudden, somebody else is, is their BFF. What happened to the forever part? <laughs> With God, He really is. He's a best friend better than any friend we can have. Amen. We sing that other song. What a friend we have in Jesus, you know. I mean, that, that's a kind of friend that, that we should cherish is the friend that we have and in God, in Christ. And he says, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end, much like what we've been reading about in our study in James, you know, that <laughs> count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the proving of your faith works patience. Count it joy. Expect this is a joyful thing that's going to happen. And this, as Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time, thorny ways, are not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It is something to keep in mind as we go through whatever we're going through. Heaven is better. Just keep heaven in mind as you're going through whatever things you're going through. In the next verse, it says that God does undertake to guide the future as He has the past. You think about some of the things that were said in the book of Isaiah, as, I, as God is distinguishing Himself from the false gods and how they can't tell you really what happened in the past and they, before man was around especially. They can't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but He does. Declaring the end from the beginning, He says in Isaiah 46 and verse 10. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And if some of this is describing some of the things that are written in Isaiah as well as in many of the prophets are talking about some of the destruction that's coming on these, at the time, enemies of, of the Israelites. And in the next verse he says, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. When, when God is bringing Babylon against Assyria, even though they didn't recognize it, that was God accomplishing what He'd already said He was going to do. He says, I, indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. I don't know which is more extraordinary. When God does these very overt miracles like the parting of the Red Sea, I mean, I'd love to have seen that. I don't think the Cecil DeMille did a good enough job on, you know, depicting that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was pretty good for the day, but it wasn't a real thing. It really happened. It wasn't just some, you know, special effects thing that was put together with camera tricks or things, you know, that have been done in times since. This really happened. Or, or to see the creation itself, or to see the flood, or to see any of the other extraordinary things that Jesus did when He calmed the sea, or He rose the dead. Raised the dead. But I don't know which is more extraordinary. Those kind of things? Or God working through His own providence to bring about the timing of what he's doing and what he said he's going to do. I mean, think of all the intricate parts, all the different people that are involved, all of the decisions that they're making with the free will that God is manipulating in whatever way to bring about what he wants to do. Because he says, he doesn't just say, I've spoken it because I know it's going to happen. He said, I, have, I will bring it to pass. I will do it. He's doing these things. So if He's done that, and we're asking for His help today, that's something else we can be confident about, about God keeping His promises. Especially the promises that He makes about salvation and eternal life. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 17 says this, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability or unchangeableness of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for left refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We can have strong 
consolation. Strong confidence in what God is saying. But he says by two unchangeable things. It's in, one is, it's impossible for God to lie. That does not change about God. and never has and never will. And the second thing that's unchangeable is that He makes promises. When He makes a promise and He can't lie, then He will keep His promise. So we read about the promises of salvation, whether it has to do with being forgiven and made in a right relationship with God, or whether it has to do with eternal salvation that relates to us being taken up into heaven and being with Him eternally. These are things we can have confidence in. So as the song says in relation to that, thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. Don't let the things that are going on around us shake our confidence in the promises of God. Because we just remember who He is. Remember who Jesus is. Remember what He can do. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 39, there was the storm on the sea. And remember, Jesus is asleep in the boat. They wake him up. Why are you sleeping? <laughs> and he stands up. He rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. You know, I've been on the water in a couple of different storms. Um, one, I was in a... <laughs> I was in a little boat with no motor on it out on a lake me and a friend and it, it, was, a, it was just a little john boat you know and uh, we had oars but the wind was it wasn't letting us get there and the water's sla- lapping over the sides the storm kind of came up out of nowhere kind of like the monsoons it's one of those kind of storms it can be a pretty frightening thing I mean, imagine, just to imagine being in that and then someone standing up and saying, peace be still, and all of a sudden it's like glass, you know. And it says in verse 41, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I mean, it shouldn't, on the one hand, if we're standing there with a man and this happens, we'd say, who is this? that the wind and the sea obey Him. It was part of His testimony of who He is. And it shouldn't surprise us. Yes, God can stop the wind from blowing. He can stop the waves from, from rolling. He can, he can do those things. And He can keep His promises that He makes to us. The waves and winds still know the voice who ruled them, the song says. And then it says, we will be forever with the Lord. Then we who are alive and remain, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Maybe a short time, maybe a long time to be with the Lord. But what a wonderful thing to know that. That becomes a time of no more parting. In fact, there's a number of things that are also mentioned in the song about disappointment, grief, and fear being gone. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, a lot of the blessings are not just what will be, but what won't be. Things that take, make life, even the, even the wonderful times that we have and the joys that we have in this life, they're dampened by things like death and sorrow and pain. He says there's not going to be any more of that. And that indeed, as the song goes on to say, talks about love's purest joys restored. How much joy will there be? How much joy will you fear, feel? At that time, hearing the words, entered thou into the joy of thy Lord. (laughs) 
And Peter writes about it in 1 Peter 1 and verse 8 when he says, Whom having not seen you love, though, you, though now you do not see Him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. See, it's also something, as he's describing it here, that we can actually feel some of that right now. If we kind of put ourselves in thinking about how wonderful it is that we have this great hope of being with the Lord. And as he says, that we're going to meet Him all safe and blessed as the song ends, we shall meet at last. Okay, we, we, we know by faith, we, we, we see Him, so to speak, in a, in, with eyes of faith. We even sing some songs about that. But I'm talking about actually meeting Him. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are, all, we are children of God and it has not yet been, re been revealed what we shall be. That, I think that goes back to some, somewhat of the way Paul describes what it will be like with our resurrected body, our spiritual body that he describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and people asking, well, what kind of body is it going to be like? And if you read that, you realize he never answers the question. He does not know. <laughs> I don't think he did. And is it that God doesn't tell us that because He just wants us to trust Him? Or is it because we probably wouldn't even understand it if He tried to tell us? Be like ex trying to explain calculus to a three-year-old. <laughs> but He says this, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. The best is yet to come. Let's sing this song. I have it on the screen if you want to look up here, but you can use your book either way you want to do it. I'm going to ask for, how many of you know this song? Three. No, it's more than that. It's not a hard song. Mm -hmm. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, He faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as He has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. His voice who rule them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone. Sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul. When change and tears are past, all safe and blessed.
Jesus said we shall meet at last. So we'll now have an invitation of one who doesn't share that hope, who doesn't share that promise that you can have this when you choose to come to Christ. If you're not a Christian, we invite you to come forward. If there's any way that we can help you in returning to Him, if we can help in any way, come forward as we stand and while we sing.